Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Guitaristas. As you can see, I've got another box in front of me and my dinner knife at the ready. So you can probably guess what's going to happen next. New guitar day. This has just arrived. So I've rushed it over here so that I can unbox it and then we're going to review it all in this film. Okay, so it'll probably be quite a long one. We're going to start right now by opening it because I'm as excited as you are to find out what's inside. Obviously, I do know what it is because I bought it, but equally, I'm looking forward to actually getting my hands on it now and uh, having a fiddle about with it. So without further ado, as some people say, I don't often say that. I don't know why I just said it, but I'll say it again. Without further ado, let's get stuck in. Nice sort of packing foam. It's only single boxed, but look, that sort of keeps it all in place, I think. <laughs> it's a bigger case than the uh, the other ones, so it's quite a nice case. Kind of soft. You can tell I'm excited, can't you? I'll show you on the overhead shot. Man. So here it is. <laughs> SB59V. Antique varnish, that stands for the V. That's the finish. Talk about that in a bit. And this is the antique gold burst. What a thing of beauty, eh? <laughs> now, I won't lie to you. It's Monday now. That unboxing I filmed on Friday because the guitar arrived and I couldn't wait. So I rushed it over here to, to get a head start and unbox it and make a start so I could then take it home and play it. Um, and I filmed a fair bit more than that. However, my mind was elsewhere. I wasn't concentrating because I'd noticed, as I got it out of the case, in fact, I noticed this scratch, which some of you may have noticed already. It's quite a, quite a long scratch there. And I couldn't remember seeing that. Uh, I tried this guitar out. I went to uh, Coda Music in Stevenage, where I bought this from a week or so ago. And I tried this out and alongside a nitro finish one, which is the, the cheaper one. I'll talk about that in a bit, but... Uh, anyway, I, I bought this because I was quite taken with it. So, you know, when I opened it just then, I saw this scratch and I thought, I don't remember that. And it was significant enough to, to, to weigh on my mind. And also it, looked, it was like somebody had maybe sat on the box so the, the knobs were pressed right down and wouldn't turn. So I've, I've loosened them off now. They're fine. But I oh, had a scratch. That's, I, I wasn't sure how I felt about that. So... I, uh, I thought I'd better contact the shop. So yeah, I emailed them and uh, sent them a picture and, uh, and, and in the meantime, took it home to have a bit of a play. When I got home, they'd replied straight away and sent me a picture of it on their website, clearly showing the scratch. So yeah, it was on there in my guitar shop blindness. I just hadn't noticed or I can't remember noticing it. So uh Anyway, they said, um, yeah, if you want to return it, it's not a problem at all. Well done, Coda Music, for, for making that offer without any hesitation. <laughs> Unlike some others that I might probably have mentioned in the past. I, I, I didn't. I said, no, nah, thank you very much for the offering. But I, I like it. I, I would like to keep it. Thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, job done. What you need to know, obviously, is that antique varnish finish scratches very easily. So my feeling is it, it adds to the kind of the relic finish. I mean, the whole thing is obviously a bit of a relic job anyway. Not sure whether that's meant to be part of it, but I'm pretty certain that there'll be a few more scratches added to it pretty soon anyway. So, yeah, not a problem for me. Others may have felt differently about it. And um, it's good to know that, you know, if, if you 
if, if this was you, you could have returned it if you'd wanted to. So, yeah, nice one, Coda. Right, let's move on, do some specs. So Eastman Guitars, I've covered a little bit more about the history of Eastman in the 55DC review that I did. I'll put a link to that in the description box if you want to find out a little bit more, or you could just Google it like I did. Uh, but yeah, Eastman are a Chinese company. These guitars are handmade in their workshop in Beijing, in China. This particular one, the antique varnish, is, I suppose, the high-end model. This, you know, Les Paula like it, it retails at £2,299. So it's proper money, you know, it's not a cheap Chinese knockoff. <laughs> well, I don't think it is anyway. Yeah, £2,299 is, um, is the retail price. Street price, in reality, more like two grand. I actually paid £1,799 for this. So they can be had for much more. Oh, it depends what you call reasonable money, you know. A lot of people are going to straight away sniff and they go, that's a lot of money for a Chinese guitar. Yeah, we'll watch on a little bit further. So this model comes in this antique gold burst. It comes in a red burst. It comes in a classic finish. And it comes in an antique black. They're nice looking guitars, aren't they? So what's it made out of? African mahogany called Akume. Very lightweight, very stable African mahogany. A single piece of solid mahogany, as is the neck, set neck obviously, but it's a single piece. There's no wings stuck to the headstock on this like there are on Gibson's. So this is the antique varnish finish, which does mean they're finished off by hand. And we did all the innuendos last week in the uh, in the three-way P90 Junior comparison. So we won't do any more of those now. This is hand, I can't help it, can I? It's hand rubbed. It's kind of like a, a, a can cabinet maker's French polishing technique where layers of the varnish are, are put on by hand. I mean, it is a properly handmade guitar to start with and with this right through to the end, you know, the finish is put on by hand as well. And it gives it this, well, firstly, a fabulously tactile feel. It feels just beautiful. It feels like a really old guitar. It really does. And that's all I can say. And obviously it gives it this kind of light relicking effect. You can see the edges are, look a little bit worn. And it's got, you know, areas of stuff, little tire, a little bit of chipping. We don't know if the scratch is, is meant to be there or not, but it didn't look out of place. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, it's a really attractive feeling guitar. The minute you pick it up, you go, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is something, I'll tell you. So what we'll do now, um, we'll weigh it and then we'll get the strings off. So yeah, let's get stuck into that. Here we go. Seven pound nine ounces. 3.45 kilograms. So it gets my vote. You know I like I like light guitars. And for a Les Paul to be under eight pounds is just sweet. Let's have a closer look. So this has got an ebony fingerboard. Beautiful ebony fingerboard on this. It's a 12 inch radius. The scale length is 24 and three quarter scale length, same as Gibson. Uh, this has got, the specs are quite detailed on this guitar. It's got Jeskar FW, which stands for fret wire, 47104 fret wire. The fretwork is just top notch. I'll do some close ups now, drop some close ups in so you can see the, the fret ends. As we'll discover, this is a custom shop level guitar. So, you know everything about it. I'm saying that now because I've, I've got to know it a little bit over the weekend. Everything about this guitar is just top notch. It's a proper handmade guitar and it's made with love. You know, you, there aren't, I'm going to say that, I'm going to look before I say this out loud. 
there are no obvious tooling marks. Okay, there are no obvious tooling marks. The paint blemishes are kind of meant to be there. This has got a bone nut. The tuning stability on this has been actually outstanding. I'm going to say that because I because I thought about that last night I was playing it and I didn't I couldn't remember how many times I'd even had to tweak it. The tuners, as is the the bridge and the tailpiece, this is um, Age Nickel Go To. It's from the Go To Relic series. Oops, bridge has fallen off. Um, there you go. There's the tuners, um, and they're aged nickel. They look nice, don't they? The buttons look nice, don't they? Really nicely aged, don't they? I've ever seen quite as yellowed as that. They look old. And the go-to aged nickel bridge has just fallen off, showing me on the back. Go to Japan. As is that. Let's get the scales and weigh them. Yeah, super lightweight. Let's start with the tailpiece. 27 grams. It's a thing of beauty. And the um, ABR1 style bridge, obviously. It's just under 50 grams, 49 grams. So, yeah, very cool. Um, right, okay, so while we're on the bridge, I wanted to note the post. On this guitar, they screw directly into the body. There's no metal bushings on these. This is the vintage Gibson style and custom shop style way. I'm not going to move that too much. The thumbnail... The thumb wheels, <laughs> the thumb wheels move. I'll show you a little bit on that overhead cam. Hopefully, that's going to pick that up. Yeah, that's that's how you raise and lower the the bridge. The posts just connect directly into the wood. They don't have mes metal. <laughs> I can't speak. I'm so excited by this discovery. They don't have metal bushings like. The Gibson Original Series, all Gibson Original Series have metal bushings, and most import guitars have metal bushings. Most guitars have metal bushings, except for original Gibsons and custom shop Gibsons. And um, when I picked this up, I was like, oh, delighted to see that, because I think it's a thing. I was also delighted to see that the, the Nitro finish, the, the cheaper version, is the same, okay? It, so, again, it, it suggests that these are built at vintage spec or custom shop level, I imagine they're trying to, they are trying to recreate the vintage Gibsons. I suppose a little bit like the Japanese did in the 70s. Um, these guys seem to be making a real great job of it, I must say. So yeah, I'm gushing a bit about this because I'm a fan of this guitar. This hardware straight away is top notch, the tuners, the fret job, everything about that so far. The neck <laughs> feels really comfortable, feels really comfortable. I don't, they don't say what profile it is, um, so let's measure it. Okay, so here's the neck profile and measurements at the first fret. And here's the neck profile and measurements at the 12th fret. This is definitely a nice full round C shape. The nitro version that I played had a, a very pronounced and really nice V. Onto the pickups, these are custom aged and wound Lola, Lola Imperials. Okay, so let's take the readings, shall we? Let's start with the bridge. We have got 8.26, 8.27K, and the inductance is reading 4.61 Henry's. That's on the bridge, and on the neck, 
we've got uh, slightly lower, 7.37k, and the inductance of that is 3.89 Henry's. Okay, and the middle reading, just for the sake of it, is 3.89k. There you go. So let's look under the hood. Before we do that, we should just note we've got gold speed knobs with thumb bleeders and a three-way switch. It doesn't tell us what type of switch is. We'll have a look in a minute. Okay, let's have a look under these. You can see a long neck tenon straight away. You can see the maple cap. And obviously you can see the, the neck joint and it's definitely looking, it looks really handmade to me. I mean, clearly they use routers, but I don't think they have CNC. I'm pretty sure they don't. Sure as I can be, I don't actually know, but I've heard. Look at that. And the the back of the pickup there says Imperial Neck something Lola pickups, and there's some scribble, which may be the winder or something. They don't give you much slack on the wiring on these. I noticed that with one of their other models. So there's a Chinese style sort of, what well, looks like a Chinese style stamp there. Big old chunk of maple on the cap. Lovely. And uh, yeah, I can't really, I can't flip that pickup. I don't know if you can see that. It just says, yeah, again, you know, Lola, Bridge, Imperial, and some writing that we'll never be able to decipher anyway. Let's pop those back. So here in the control cavity, we've got CTS 500K pots. You know that from the spec sheet. Sprague orange drop caps. These are a 0.47s. And um, they are wired center tone lug to the hot lug on the volume, both the same. There you go. It's pretty what it is really, isn't it? Straightforward, all, obviously all hand wired. Here's the switch. Yeah, it's just like a, well, it looks like a switchcraft, doesn't it? Maybe it is. And last but not least, <laughs> as they say, let's just have a look under this ebony truss rod cover. This is made of ebony, believe it or not. I like the way as well, the screw, it's only got one screw holding it on. And the screw goes inside the cavity there. So it's quite neat if you, if you know what I mean or can see what I mean maybe. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's got the, what I call bell end truss rod adjuster, the Gibson style, the proper, looks like it does business uh, nut to uh, adjust. Let's see if I can get that in focus. Looks solid, doesn't it? Yeah, looks solid. Um, I haven't, needed to check it works, but I'm pretty certain it does. Okay, we'll pop that back and we'll put some strings on it and then we'll come back and plug it in. See what it sounds like. See you in a minute. Here we are, plugged in. New set of strings, unplugged, it sounds like this.
it's got a nice spank to it. I have top wrapped it, I doubt that makes a lot of difference, but I thought I'd give it a go. So, plugged into the Princeton 65 again. On the ball today, oh, here's a shot of the settings, by the way, so you can, you can see. I'm using the ox attenuator, the amps cranked to about eight, I think it is. Um, on the board, I've got a TC Spark Booster to give it a little bit of oomph, extra oomph, if and when I need it. And I, I thought I'd put the rat pedal on there as well, in case I fancied getting a bit dirty later. You'll see when I tread on them, okay, via Crocs cam, of course. So, no pedals on. It sounds like this, and I've rolled the volumes back to seven. I'll just have a little noodle around and you should be able to see, you know, I'll, I'll play around with the knobs via knob cam there. You should be able to see what I'm doing. And then we'll play something.
There you go. It sounds great, doesn't it? It really does sound great. The pickups, Lola Imperials, don't forget. I think they're they're quite a low output, vintage style, PAF style pickups. But what's great about them is they've got they've got enough oomph. They they drive the amp really well when you want them to, and they clean up really nicely. And all of the controls in this guitar work great. I hope you've seen that. I've been mucking around with them a fair bit and there'll be some more playing when I do turn up the wick <laughs> a little bit more. It gets a little bit more frantic towards the end. I think you'll find, obviously, I haven't fully edited this yet, but um, I think that's the plan. There's some more stuff coming. <laughs> thoroughly enjoyed playing this and for me for me to say that about Les Paul it's quite a rare thing quite a special thing I'm not the biggest Les Paul fan in fact I sometimes think well do I even like Les Pauls I've got some affordable ones which I do like because they're affordable you know I've got the Tokai and I've got a couple of Epiphones the, the Les Paul Custom and the Les Paul 50s Gold Top and I love them because they're, you know, they're all, you know, around about 500 quid guitars. So they don't really owe you anything. They look bloody great. And they'll do the Les Paul thing when you want them to. But as far as expensive Les Pauls are concerned, I've recently sold my R8, as you know, you'll know if you follow the channel. Because it's a guitar that's, it's a, you know, three and a half grand guitar that didn't really get played because I didn't really love it. I respected it, I admired it, I perved at it a lot because it looked great, you know, and it was that, oh, wow, this is that Gibson Custom Shop thing. It's it's the real deal. But to be honest with you, it meant a lot more to the lovely guy that bought it from me than it did for me. And I haven't looked back. You know, that's been gone for a couple of months now. And I haven't looked back for one second. Okay, I still got a Gibson Custom Shop R4, gold top but as far as traditional 59 style you know les paul or les paul standards are concerned you know humbuckers tunomatic or abr1 bridges i'm still on the fence uh i've got the gibson les paul standard as you know that i have a an ongoing <laughs> do i don't i like it relationship with so then I've bought this to see how it compares because I've seen so many positive reviews of the Eastman SB59, which is, you know, that's what this is. I don't think I've seen a bad review of an Eastman, uh, let alone the, 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 the Les Pauls, even people, even the proper YouTubers, you know, not, not chances like me, even the proper ones that are in shops comparing High-end Gibson Les Pauls with Eastmans are saying, yeah, this is great. You know, they often, most often, choose the Gibson, as you'd expect. But I don't think I've seen anyone say, oh, no, it's, you know, I know people say it's good, but it's not really. And there are a lot of guitars I can think of that I've seen loads of positive reviews about. But when I've looked at them, I've thought, well, it's not really, is it? And so obviously I thought I'd look into the world of Eastman and as you know, if you follow the channel, I picked up the the double cut, the 55DC, which I gave a glowing report on. And then just last week, I sneaked in the Eastman 55 single cut, 
you know, Les Paul Jr. like, which you heard sounded fucking fantastic. So this arrives, a Les Paul alike, a 59 Les Paul, that I'm not even sure I like that style of guitar. So I'm delighted, I'm delighted to find that this one is brilliant. I loved playing it. I really loved playing this guitar. Okay, so here's the thing. These films I make every week, the, the production of these films runs over pretty much always four days, okay, on average. It's very rare that during that period, I'm looking at the guitar I'm reviewing, I'm perving on it, and I'm wanting to take it home to play it at home. Because once I'm, once it's here, I mean, the guitar stays here, and uh, I film it. So yeah, I, all week I've been looking at this, wanting to pick it up and play it some more, because it feels so fantastic. It feels fantastic to play, it's comfortable, and I don't know when I've ever said that a Les Paul is comfortable, but, but, but for some reason, this is really comfortable. It may just be something to do with the weight. I mean, it's a good pound, probably lighter than most Les Pauls. It's under eight pounds. It's very easy to, you know, when you pick it up, you don't go, Ooh, here's a lump. It's, and I don't know if it's that, I don't know. I don't know what it is, <laughs> but it's comfortable. It feels comfortable, as I've said. The, the the finish on this is it just feels lovely. It feels like a vintage guitar, and that leads me nicely onto the <laughs> the next bit, the finish. As we know, this this model, the antique varnish, is made to look like an old guitar, a little bit worn in, beaten up, and this this one in particular came with the added scratch here, which we talked about earlier, and as you can see. There's now another scratch. I did say, I reckon it'll, you know, I'll be adding a few. Well, I've put one on it already, as you can see. I I found the bit of film where that happened. Here you go. A bit of slow-mo. It looks like I caught that with my finger there on the upstroke. And I've put another scratch in it. And you can also see that where I've been picking, I've already started to relic the guitar, because it's got no pick guard this, so you can see I've, I've already got pick attack marks here. Now I quite like that. For me, I've always, I've always looked at those original guitars that people have played over a very long period and, and worn in, in their own playing style. <laughs> and wondered if it's ever likely that I could actually play a guitar enough to have it look like that. Well, it looks like this one might. You know, I've only played this for a few hours and I've already started to add my own DNA to it or whatever you want to call it. But that ain't going to be for everyone. If you're not into guitars that are going to mark up and relic in a playing way, I'm going to say that in a playing way, okay, because I did criticise the Gibson Les Paul that I've got for marking up. The Nitro is very fragile. But I'll show you what I mean. I'll put that into context, right? Here it is. My heritage cherry Les Paul standard. Can you see that big old stand rash mark? That's what I was complaining about. I don't want my guitars to relic just by sitting on their stands overnight. And that happened pretty much overnight and has got worse since because I'm still too lazy to, 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 to wrap a towel around the stand. But this one's been on it as well. Same stand. Exactly the same type of stand. No mark whatsoever. This has been on that a week. So... Yeah, I don't, I'm not a fan of guitars that relic themselves. Marks that I put on, yeah, great. I did that, you know, it's a badge of honour. But it's not going to be for everyone. So if if that's not for you, look at they do the Nitro Finish one, of course, which I've said, which is cheaper anyway. I have heard, or well, someone said in the comments, they've stopped doing Nitro now. They've maybe gone over to water-based paint. But... Whatever it is, avoid the antique varnish because it's very thin. It will scratch and mark very easily. I'll put a link to Reverb in the description box so you can see a whole range of different types everywhere in the world, I guess. So they are available pretty much everywhere, but, you know, not as 
commoners, common guitars. <laughs> so cost-wise, I think these are worth the money. I mean, they're not well, they're not what you call affordable, but they're also not what you'd call expensive in today's market, are they? This model is going to cost you around about two grand. If you're lucky enough to get a deal like I did, you know, seventeen hundred ninety-nine quid, two thousand dollars. It's a lot of money. Yeah, you could you could get a Les Paul standard for that, a Gibson Les Paul standard for that. I I have well, I, honestly. Well, what I'm going to do a compare. I'll do a proper comparison. Let's not say one way or another for the purposes of this film. Let's save that, and I'll do a side by side with this. And, and the heritage cherry heritage cherry Les Paul standard, and then we can we can actually go through each thing in detail, and then we can we can say which one's best. But this is certainly what well, I've said. It's a custom shop level guitar. I think this is a custom shop guitar. It's made in the Eastman Custom Shop in Beijing in China. It's handmade there. It's got the best components that money can buy from other parts of the world. But it happens to be made in China. If if the origin of this doesn't bother you, and it will bother a lot of people, I understand that and appreciate that, but if the, uh, if the origin of this doesn't bother you, if you fancy a custom shop guitar that costs standard money, definitely try one. And definitely try it alongside the more expensive custom shop guitars as well. I can only speak for myself. I prefer playing this than I did playing my R8. It's just how I feel about it. But I'm sure Hen, the lovely guy that bought that, will be laughing at me. <laughs> He'll be laughing at me that I let such a treasure go because he's really into that guitar, which is brilliant. There you go. I... I like this guitar. We'll um, we'll roll it out in a few weeks' time, and we'll compare it with uh, the Gibson Les Paul Standard. Similarly priced. This is always going to be a little bit cheaper. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if they go up once the word continues to spread. They're still relatively new. If you know, if if some of you believe what I'm telling you now about how good this feels, you can see what it's made out of. Maybe I made it sound reasonable as well. You might be convinced the prices might start going up. We don't know, but I'm. It's funny every guitar that I get because I'm a guitar addict. You know that, and I see. So I got the double cut, and then I had to get the single cut, and then I had to find out what the fifty nine was like. In spite of the fact that I don't didn't really think that I liked Les Pauls that much. I had to get this and I always think, well, I'll just sell it if I don't like it or I'll sell that one, or I'll sell that one. Um, and that seems to happen less often than the buy-in. And of course, I thought, well, once I've got the, the 59, you know, I don't, I don't think there's anything else that I need this year. You know, let's try and, let's try and slow down a little bit <laughs> or we'll, before we go out of business. And then I saw they did a bloody limited edition 54 black staple pickup you know the one fortunately there's none available there. and i made about 40 of them but i'm going to keep my eye open because that looks so sexy and if it plays anything like this it'll be another les paul that i will play for fun and i never thought i never thought i'd actually say i'll play a les paul for fun uh, but that's what I'm. That's what I'm going to do with this one anyway tonight. I'm going to take it home now. Now I've finished filming it. I'm going to take it home. I'm going to play it all weekend because I love it, and I'm going to put some more marks on it, put some more scratches on it, and see what it turns out like. You know, in a while. <laughs> there you go. That's it for this week. I hope that's been something. Thanks again for joining us. Not sure what I'm up to next week. I've got an inkling. But I'm gonna I'm gonna have a think about it over the weekend while I'm playing this, and um, come back next Friday, same time, same place, and let's find out.
All right. See you then. Cheers for now. Ta-da.